Hello and welcome to Reading the Victorian Novel. This is the fourth episode of my Great Expectations series. In this video, we will be talking about chapters 20 to 24, weekly parts 13 to 15. If you're reading along, you might notice that we are now in volume two, and so your book might say chapter one. I'm going to be using the continuous chapters as it appeared in its weekly serial in all the year round. So in these chapters, chapter 20, we're going to London and we'll be at Jaggers' office and in the town and the vicinity around there. Then chapter 21, still in London, we're at Barnard's Inn. Chapter 22, London and Barnard's, and we go to the west of London to Hammersmith, where the pockets live. Chapter 23 is also in Hammersmith. And then chapter 24, we return to Jaggers' office. So we're going to start with the arrival to London and the introduction to the hackney coach. Nevertheless, a hackney coachman, who seemed to have as many capes to his greasy greatcoat as he was years old, packed me up in his coach and hemmed me in with a folding and jingling barrier of steps, as if he were going to take me 50 miles. His getting on his box, which I remember to have been decorated with an old, weather-stained, pea-green hammercloth, moth-eaten into rags, was quite a work of time. It was a wonderful equipage with six great coronets outside and ragged things behind for I don't know how many footmen to hold on by, and a harrow below them to prevent amateur footmen from yielding to the temptation. So the thing that you have to know about a hackney cab is that it is a recycled and repurposed aristocrat's carriage. And so it is a sign of class, but of the changing class climate that has happened in London, in Britain. So we see this present in the passage a little bit as well, where we have this idea that it's decorated, but the things that are decorating it are old, eaten into rags, a work of time. Calling it a wonderful equipage with six great coronets, that is six small crowns. And here from Wikimedia, I've included kind of what this would look like. Um, those gives us another sense of the past that is still present, but it's been transformed and changed. The last element in my quotation here is the idea of footmen, because a cab obviously does not need footmen to accompany it, and yet we still have the evidence of it. And then this very funny idea that amateur footmen, right, people that see it going by would be like, oh, I'm just going to jump on and take a ride. Um, and so what we're introduced to right away in this opening paragraph of chapter 20 is class and the class system that maybe is no longer present, but still has presence. So here, let's just talk briefly about the hierarchy and what I have for my illustrations are the crown jewels of England and then also Joe from Bleak House. Joe, who's so poor he can't even afford an E on his name. So at the top of our class hierarchy, we have the aristocracy, ruled over by the monarch who controlled the entrance to the aristocracy, which was marked by land ownership, birth, education, marriage, etc. At the lowest level of the aristocracy, you had barons, and then baronets, and then knights. And the baronet and the knight are going to be important for these chapters because we learn about Bentley Drummle, that he was the next heir but one to a baronetcy, and about Mrs. Pocket, she was the only daughter of a certain quite accidental deceased knight who had invented for himself a conviction that this deceased father would have been made a baronet. So Mrs. Pocket's delusions are that her lowest class aristocratic father would have been promoted up into the hierarchy. Then below them, we have the landed gentry, people with a lot of land. Below that, the professional class, kind of the burgeoning professional class, doctors, lawyers, and clergy. Um, and then the middle class, which is even more um, strikingly increasing in this period with increased opportunities for trade, et cetera. And then below them, the working class, and then your underclass and poor at the very bottom. The underclass and poor, these are the people that are going to be surrounding Jaggers' office, begging for help from him. Outside of Jaggers' office, we have a brief introduction to the geography of London. And we read because he, um, Jaggers is busy. And so Pip has to pass the time. And so he goes on a little tour. 
So he came into Smithfield, and the shameful place, being all a smear with filth and fat and blood and foam, seemed to stick to me. So I rubbed it off with all possible speed by turning into a street where I saw the great black dome of St. Paul's bulging at me from behind a grim stone building, which a bystander said was Newgate Prison. And so if we look here at the map from Dickens's London, which is a remarkable website that I recommend you all spend time on, we have Smithfield just right here, and below that is Newgate, and then here you can see St. Paul's. So within relatively a very narrow space, we have three locations that I think are being set up for thematic resonance. And so let's look at that a little bit. So I have what might be a confusing chart, um, but we start with the location, Smithfields. What is it? It's a live cattle market. So people bring the beef in, or the cattle in, they get sold and butchered, and they leave as beef. And so what we have then is this idea of the animal. Um, the collateral is you give money, you get meat. In St. Paul's, which is an Anglican, Anglican cathedral, our collateral is souls. We bring in human bodies and we fight to, for salvation for the soul. And then lastly, at Newgate, which is a prison, we bring in bodies and either the bodies leave as a body that's living or they are hanged and leave as a body that is a dead body. And so there's something really interesting happening here with the idea almost of different levels from the animal to the human to the soul kind of progressing. So we can think about this in a number of ways that this is kind of a, a, a novel that's interested in what it means to be human and to have the idea or the potential for salvation, whatever that's going to mean. In chapter 22, we are introduced to Herbert. And it's a striking moment because uh, we begin with some names, which resonates, but then also we have a broken deal around the name. So this is Herbert talking. Will you do me the favor to begin at once to call me by my Christian name, Herbert? I thanked him and said I would. I informed him in exchange that my Christian name was Philip. Oh, I don't take to Philip, said he, smiling. Would you mind Handel for a familiar name? There's a charming piece of music by Handel called the Harmonious Blacksmith. So this use of Christian name should be keyed into you now, right? From the opening paragraph of the novel where Pip says, my Christian name being Philip, my father's name being um, Pirip, I could call myself nothing other than Pip. And then last episode, we talked about Orlick. Orlick, who said his Christian name was Dolge. And then Pip declared that was a lie, thereby um, taking away some of that authority of the Christian name. Now we have Herbert asserting his name, Pip responding with his being Philip, and then being renamed. However, as smiling as Herbert is, there's a little bit of an undercurrent of suspicion here because um, the first stipulation of the inherit of the kind of great expectations that Pip has come into is from chapter 18. This is Jagger's Mr. Pip. You are to understand first that you always bear the name of Pip. And now, within seconds of meeting somebody new, we see Pip doubly renamed. First, he calls himself Philip, and then he gets renamed to Handel, removing himself even farther from the pippiness of Pip. Along with this idea of class, the major, uh, we have other quotations that are going to support this. And this is Herbert speaking again, and he's going to um, tell us his opinions about gentlemen and their jobs. I don't know why it should be a crack thing to be a brewer, but it is indisputable that while you cannot possibly be genteel and bake, you may be as genteel as never was and brew. You see it every day. Yet a gentleman may not keep a public house, may he? Said I. Oh, not on any account, returned Herbert, but a public house may keep a gentleman. So the second part of this quote is a joke. The first part, though, has to do with the history of the class system in which um, certain work unions had enough power that they um, got people to vote that they could become gentlemen. So the brewer's trade was so strong that they were able to lobby for it, whereas the baker was not. 
And then we have this joke about a gentleman may not keep a public house, may he, but a public house may keep a gentleman. So this refers to the idea of working. Right? A gentleman can't work in a public house, keeping it up, but he can own it and gain the profits from it, and that's it's keeping him, or he can live in it, and then it's like sustaining him as well, but he's paying to be there, but he cannot work in it. He can't do the maintaining of it. This is followed by a explanation of who um, or what a gentleman is. And so we have here a view from Mr. Pocket worded through his son. This is about the man who jilted Habersham. But that he was not to be without ignorance or prejudice mistaken for a gentleman, my father most strongly asseverates because it is a principle of his that no man who was not a true gentleman at heart ever was since the world began a true gentleman in manner. He says, no varnish can hide the grain of the wood and that the more varnish you put on, the more the grain will express itself. So what we have here is the idea of the interior and the exterior. So the gentleman in manner is the gentleman who dresses himself properly and who behaves in a courtly manner, having knowing what fork to use, for instance. But the gentleman at heart is one who is good at heart, literally a gentle human, a gentle man. And then we have this kind of famous metaphor of the varnish that you can put all this polish onto somebody, but the more you put on, the easier it is to tell what kind of person that is at the core. And what's interesting about this is that earlier on, we actually had these terms laid out on the same page. So this is the moment when Pip was telling Biddy he had come into his great expectations. And he's um, sad or complaining that Joe doesn't have good manners. And so Biddy says, oh, his manners? Won't his manners do then? Asked Biddy. And then at the bottom of the same page, Pip says to Biddy, you are envious and grudging. You're dissatisfied on account of my rise in fortune. You can't help showing it. To which Biddy responds, if you have the heart to think so, say so. Say so over and over again, if you have the heart to think so. Pip, if you have the heart to be so mean, Biddy, don't put it off upon me. And so on this page, we have the idea that Joe, who is gentleman of gentlemen at heart, doesn't have the manners that Pip wants. But Pip, in the way he's behaving, is showing us that he might gain those manners, but currently he does not have the right heart. And so we'll watch what happens as these things play out. Then we get um, Herbert's desires. His goals. I think I shall trade, says he, leaning back in his chair, to the East Indies for silks, shawls, spices, dyes, drugs, and precious woods. Oh, it's an interesting trade. I think I shall trade also, said he, putting his thumbs in his waistcoat pockets, to the West Indies for sugar, tobacco, and rum, also to Ceylon, especially for elephant's tusks. So the East Indies is India and China, and that's why we have the silk, kind of a reference to the, the Silk Road, shawls, spices, dyes, and drugs. Um, indigo, one of the main dyes that they would have. Drugs, of course, being opium, um, precious woods. And then we have the West Indies. The West Indies is the Caribbean islands. And there you're going to get your sugar, tobacco, and rum, your products that come from the enslavement of human beings over there. And then he jumps back to Ceylon, which is Sri Lanka for elephant's tusks, which is ivory, think for like your piano keys and your decorations. Um, and so what I wanna emphasize here with this is we have in this tiny set of islands, a large city, London, and in a small room, we have two young men. And one of them, Herbert, is able to cast his imagination to the extremes of the British empire all the way out here to India and Ceylon in the east, and all the way over here to Barbados and the rest of the Caribbean um, to the west. And there's a sense here of 
Herbert as a product of empire, like an inheritor of empire. It's easy for him to imagine that these things that he's only ever been aware of in his like imagination and seen through products, he can command them. He can trade them and move them. And so it's a, it's a remarkable way of thinking about the um, imperial mentality that a person like Herbert, who's smiling and seems kind, but fundamentally wants to be a capitalist and benefit from the system that degrades and demeans others under the yoke of an empire. Um, then we're going to jump to Mrs. Pocket, and we have this uh, brief description of her. She's put to a lot of satire for comic use, and we read about her dad raising her to be a royalty. So successful a watch and ward had been established over the young lady, Mrs. Pocket, by this judicious parent, that she had grown up highly ornamental, but perfectly helpless and useless. So this contrasts with the idea of the angel in the house that I talked about in the last episode around Biddy, where you have young women that are incredibly capable and kind of hold the household together. Here at the higher class, we see this mockery of both maternal and kind of domestic abilities um, that's put on her. And I do like that Dickens puts part of the blame not on Mrs. Pocket, but on the system of prejudice that raised her into this mentality. Other characters you might think of for this would be somebody like Dora in David Copperfield. Uh, so where the Pockets live is at Hammersmith. So I just wanted to show quickly just how far west that is from Barnard's Inn. So it is a, a significantly um, outside of London. And then briefly, let's talk a little bit about the craft of Dickens, because we have this moment of a, a very minor character, right? The neighbor, Mrs. Coyler. Coyler. Mr. and Mrs. Pocket had a toady neighbor. Mrs. Coyler then changed the subject and began to flatter me. I liked it for a few moments, but she flattered me so very grossly that the pleasure was soon over. She had a serpentine way of coming close at me when she pretended to be vitally interested in the friends and localities I had left which was altogether snaky and fork-tongued. And when she made an occasional bounce upon Startop, who said very little to her, or upon Drummle, who said less, I rather envied them for being on the opposite side of the table. So nothing deep that I want to go into besides this idea that Dickens has named her Mrs. Coiler, and then she has coils like a snake. And so we build out that metaphor in the language to serpentine, snaky, fork-tongued, and even bouncing, which maybe refers back to kind of the, the toady, the sycophantic. Um, so just, it's, it's playful in a, a fun way. We also have a classical allusion at the end of chapter 23. There was a sofa where Mr. Pocket stood, and he dropped upon it in the attitude of the dying gladiator. Still in that attitude, he said with a hollow voice, Good night, Mr. Pip, when I deemed it advisable to go to bed and leave him. So this is a statue that today is better known as the Dying Gaul, that people have been able to kind of identify instead of a gladiator. Uh, it's very well known in a replica as well in London, but what, who would not know it is a young pip at this age. And so what I like about this simile is, or this allusion, is it lets us know the education that pip has, the successful education under the tutelage of Mr. Pocket that enables him to make this reference, this gentlemanly reference of the art world to him. And so in a way, it's kind of, it's a, it's a compliment paying him back for the labor that Mr. Pocket put into educating that young Pip into the status of a gentleman. The last thing we're going to talk about is just a, a strange callback to this idea that Pip doesn't really understand money and numbers. So he's come to ask for some money to outfit Barnard's so that he and Herbert can live together. And he says, it's so difficult to fix a sum, said I, hesitating. Come, said Mr. Jaggers, let's get at it. Twice five, will that do? Three times five, will that do? Four times five, will that do? Well, I said, I thought that would do handsomely. Four times five, will do handsomely, will it? Said Mr. Jaggers, knitting his brows. Now, what do you make of four times five? What do I make of it? Ah, said Mr. Jaggers, how much? I suppose you make it 20 pounds, said I, smiling. So for the attentive reader, this reminds them 
of Mr. Pumblechook, for whom we learned early on that his conversation consisted of nothing but arithmetic. On my politely bidding him good morning, he said pompously, seven times nine, boy? And how should I be able to answer, dodged in that way, in a strange place, on an empty stomach? I was hungry, but before I had swallowed a morsel, he began a running sum that lasted all through breakfast, seven and four and eight and six. And then later, Mr. Pumblechuck, in chapter nine, Mr. Pumblechuck then put me through my pence table, from 12 pence make one shilling, up to 40 pence make three and four pence, and then triumphantly demanded, as if he had done me, now, how much is 43 pence? Mr. Pumblechuck worked his head like a screw to screw it out of me and said, is 43 pence, seven and six pence, three pardons, for instance. So in a way, what I want to draw attention to is, as a little boy, Pip was kind of arithmetically bullied by Pumblechook. And now, though, we have the consequences of that. Like, Pip doesn't know anything about numbers, about money, about cost. And he certainly doesn't know that there is cost in terms of numbers, but then more of a metaphysical idea, what will something cost him? So we will continue with Pip and his adventures in London as we go forward. So that is all for now.